Panel 1, Catoctin Furnace, African-American Cemetery, Interpretive Trail, read by Khalil Clash. A large blast furnace, the stack wheel and bellows in all the buildings are built in the best manner. From a notice in the Fredericktown Herald advertising the sale of the furnace property in 1811. Workers employed or owned by Thomas Johnson, a lawyer who later became the first governor of Maryland, and his brother Roger, Baker, and James built Catoctin Furnace. The Johnsons oversaw the construction beginning in 1775, and the furnace was in blast in time to provide ammunition to General George Washington and his army. As many as 271 enslaved people of African-American ancestry made up the bulk of Catoctin Furnace's workers. The operation of the furnace depended heavily on the labor of enslaved and freed African-Americans until the middle of the 19th century when their labor was replaced by European immigrants. This interpretive trail leads into the heart of Catoctin Furnace Village and to an overlook near the African-American Cemetery. It provides information about the history of the furnace, details regarding the craft of iron making, and a window into the lives of people who lived and labored here. Panel 2, read by Marquia Smith. Dirty and dangerous. The bones of Contoctin men and women show almost literally the effects of back-breaking labor. One elderly man's spine was so damaged by a lifetime of hard work that he was unable to stand up straight. Furnace labor and exposure to hazardous fumes also threatened the health of pregnant women, infants, and children. Most women died during their childbearing years, and infants and children are well represented in the Contoctin Cemetery. Making iron and forging metal was dirty and dangerous work. Back-breaking labor, burns, and fume fever caused by inhalation of airborne toxins were commonplace. Death sometimes occurred by falling into the stack or getting caught in machinery such as the water wheel. The stack before you was built in 1857 and named Isabella. She is constructed of local field stone and her chimney or bosch is lined with fire brick. In order to convert iron ore to pig iron, the furnace's fire was fed and tended until it reached the correct temperature. Next, iron ore and limestone flux were poured into the opening at the top of the furnace. Intense heat separated the iron ore from the waste or slag. Once the molten iron, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, sank to the bottom, the foundry men opened the furnace door and molten iron flowed into troughs on the sand floor of the casting shed. Moving the iron ore from the mines and the finished products to the market evolved over time. Mule and cart was the earliest technology utilized, followed in the 1830s by a dinky, narrow-gauge railroad. Finally, in 1887, the Monocacy Valley Railroad line was completed and began transporting finished products to market via the Western Maryland Railroad in Thermont. Step inside the casting shed. Can you see men working among smoke, hammering, fire, steam, sparks, and molten metal? Panel 3, read by Jacob Wise, The Watchful Eye. This is indeed gross ingratitude. It would be a serious loss to me if they would leave for Pennsylvania. You are looking directly at the site where some of the estimated 271 enslaved residents of Catoctin Furnace lived. The three-day stone building with three chimneys was torn down in the early 20th century. But the picture to the left shows what it looked like. Imagine... Parents weeding their vegetable garden plot after a long day's work at the furnace and in the Iron Master's mansion. While the toddlers may have had a few years to play, an enslaved child's workload began as early as age six, with tasks such as winding thread and carrying water. Notice the ruins of the Iron Master's mansion, uphill to your left. It was situated so that furnace bosses had a view onto all aspects of their enslaved workers' lives. According to Douglas Reed, the second floor, south bedroom was claimed by the master. This room with windows facing south and east would have afforded an unparalleled view 
day and night of the operation and workers. We ran away from the Catoctin furnace the eighth instant. A Negro man named Peter, a stout, well-made fellow, six feet high, 25 years of age, has lately had the smallpox and is much pitted. He was raised on the eastern shore in Dowchester County and calls himself Peter Dorsey. Was purchased lately from Raysa Todd of Anne Arundel County, Elk Ridge, and appears to have his right ear cropped, which no doubt he will endeavor to conceal. Had on when he went away a country linen shirt and trousers and good shoes. At the same time, ran away a Negro man named Gabriel, belonging to Edward Telfair, Esquire from Georgia. He is a stout, well made fellow, about five feet seven or eight inches high, bow legged and much pitted with smallpox. Clothing not known and was bred in the Jerseys. Whoever takes up and secures said Negroes so that their masters get them again shall receive six pounds reward or three pounds for either. James Johnson and CO. $30 reward. I ran away from the subscriber living at Catoctin's Furnace, Frederick County, Maryland. On Sunday, the 21st of Maine, Negro Dick, who calls himself Richard Thomas, he is about 20 years of age, five feet four or five inches high, stout made, very black, round faced, a likely Negro, large prominent eyes with a good deal of white in them, speaks quick and loud, very polite, has been accustomed to waiting when with his master, Thomas Wilkinson, Esquire of Calvert County. But since in my employ, the work customary about ironworks, it is supposed he has gone to Pennsylvania as he was seen in the company with a Negro man named Bob, the property of Mr. Slusser on their way to Emmitsburg. Dick took with him a superfine broadcloth, blue coat, tolerably good, any other of his clothing not recalled. The above reward will be given for securing him in any jail in the United States so that his master or the subscriber may get him again. And if brought home, any reasonable charges will be paid. Willoughby Mayberry. The editors of the Lancaster Journal, Carlisle Herald, York Recorder, an oracle of Dauphine will insert the above advertisement one month and immediately forward their accountants to this office. Catoctin Furnace, June 3rd, 1815. Panel number four, multi-talented, diversely skilled workforce. A little group of them gathered around me at the top of the furnace opening. They wept very much because they were bound to work so hard during the week as well as on Sunday in the iron smelter, and thus were seldom able to hear the word of God. The signal was given for the pouring, and each of them had to go back to work. Diary of John Frederick Schlegel, Moravian Minister, July thirtieth, 1799, describing enslaved workers at Cacotten Furnace, translated from German. Woodcutters needed to fell enough wood to provide an adequate amount of charcoal to fuel the furnace. An acre of hard wood for every 24 hours of blast. The wood was chopped into four foot lengths, no more than six inches in diameter. Colliers transformed the chopped wood into charcoal to fuel the furnace. They built and tended multiple hearths, slowly burning wood to turn it into charcoal. The coaling process took approximately 12 days of burning and four days of cooling. Fillers dumped charcoal, ore, and limestone into the tunnel head, enduring flame, smoke, and cinders. This was one of the hardest and hottest furnace jobs. One African-American worker in the cemetery had extremely high levels of zinc in his bones. Perhaps he was a filler, breathing zinc-enriched fumes at the top of the stack. Company clerks kept the books and managed the company store. The clerk ran the furnace in the absence of the iron master. Teamsters with mule-drawn wagons hauled charcoal and ore to the furnace. Before the 1830s, Teamsters also moved the finished products to market. Enslaved wagoneers Henry and Harvey are listed as property in Baker Johnson's 1809 will. Ore miners used pickaxes to break iron ore into chunks that were then washed in the stream to remove surrounding soil and impurities. The mines at Catoctin contained gothite or brown iron ore. 
Founders made sure the furnace was kept at peak efficiency by constantly adjusting the bellows and the ratio of charcoal, ore, and flux. Since the furnace was in blast around the clock, the founder was assisted by a keeper. Together they maintained a constant vigil, otherwise they ran the risk of the furnace freezing up. This meant that the molten iron within the furnace hardened before the process was completed. The only option to fix this catastrophe would be to deconstruct and rebuild the furnace entirely. This never happened at Catoctin. Panel 5. Resources. Use, reuse, recycle. Read by Khalil Clash. Notice the forest around you. The volume of wood needed for fuel meant that during the operation of Catoctin Furnace, Part of this forest looked very different from today. If you traveled up into the mountain, you would find evidence of collier pits where wood from surrounding locust, chestnut, chestnut oak trees were cut down for furnace fuel. Those tree varieties are gone and have been replaced with white oak, tulip poplar, hemlock, and birch, species chosen for valuable charcoal-making properties. See if you can find a tree along the path that has both slag, fire brick caught up in the roots. You may also see bricks and slag elsewhere along the path. The bricks were used to line the furnace discarded in the woods when the furnace needed to be relined. Slag is a waste product consists of iron impurities that have been removed by the limestone flux during the smelting process. Along with discarded fire brick, the slag was dumped throughout the village. Slag adds micronutrients to the earth by neutralizing soil acidity. It can help increase plant growth and improve soil texture by breaking down clay like soil. Village blacksmiths were recyclers. Broken farm implements and metal tools were brought to the blacksmith for repair and forged with other broken metal materials to make new, working tools. What broken metal items can you think of that a blacksmith might be able to repair? Please leave fire bricks and slags for other visitors to see and enjoy. Panel 6, Who Built This Village? Read by Aidan McClure. Some workers boarded others in their homes. In 1864, the rate for board was 12 and a half cents for each meal. Single workers could also find housing in several nearby boarding houses. Using scrip and place of money, all supplies that workers needed could be bought at the company store. As in the case of house rent, the bill was deducted from wages. In 1899, after working a month averaging 200 hours at 9 cents per hour and paying $2 house rent, it was not unusual for a man to have a store bill of $10 and to take home pay of $6. Harriet Chapel was constructed by workers owned or employed by John Brent and named as a memorial to his wife, Harriet McPherson Brent. Today, Harriet Chapel is an active Episcopal parish that welcomes visitors. Worker housing. During 130 years of operation, Worker housing was provided by the furnace owners. Rent and charges for wood to heat the house was taken directly from workers' pay. In 1858, a trustee sale advertised the ironworks with 60 houses. The 1972 National Register of Historic Places nomination noted the remaining 12 worker houses were rare and an important examples of domestic architecture. Some of the whitewashed stone houses were built by owner John Brent during the winter of 1820 and 1821 less than one year after he purchased the furnace operation. Multiple families and boarders likely shared the simply furnished dwellings. In a 1982 interview, Mary Miller Martin told Elizabeth Y. Anderson, there are strong traditions that certain houses at Catoctin Furnace were at one time slave quarters. Although she did not identify specific structures, the stone cottage that is nearest to the platform is now known as the Museum of the Iron Worker. Collier's Log House constructed of chestnut oak. The house was built circa 1810 and added to circa 1830, resulting in the double structure you see today, purchased by the Historical Society in 1980. It has been restored and converted into a historic house museum. The F.W. Fraley store operated until 1973. Heinrich Froelich was a Haitian soldier paid by the British during the Revolutionary War. Captured in Yorktown, he was sent to do hard labor at the Catoctin Iron Works while imprisoned at Frederick's Hessian Barracks. His descendants still live and work in the village. 
Panel 7, Secondary Industries and the Mill Pond, read by Ray Hatch. At the height of his operation, Kunkel, who owned the furnace from 1856 to 1885, employed about 500 men in the various operations, including mining, charcoaling, operation of the furnaces, sawmill, grist mill, store, farms, ore railroad and property construction, and maintenance. He added significantly to the houses for workmen, owning about 80 dwellings. A mill pond fed by Little Hunting Creek is directly in front of you. When filled with water, it was the source of power for many ancillary village industries. A sawmill provided lumber and a grist mill provided flour and corn mill. The Catoctin Paint Company used blue and yellow oxides from the ore bank. The tanning industry in nearby Thurmont depended on bark removed from felled trees to provide charcoal, tannin in the bark-colored highs in the leather-making process. Archaeological investigations revealed evidence of many cottage industries within village houses. Cobblers repaired shoes, seamstresses made garments, and lamp workers made glass decorations. A stave mill, making sides for wooden barrels, tubs, and vats, operated from 1914 until the early 1920s. This followed the shutdown of the iron industry and took advantage of the abundant timber on the mountain. Millions of the barrel staves were sawed and shipped by rail from Catoctin. Panel 8, read by Elaine Bond Hyman. Dynamic Nature of History The rounds that followed the shot heard round the world may well have been smelted right here in Frederick County, but the furnaces which did the job are crumbling from the weight of time and neglect. Frederick Post, February 11th, 1965 Road could reduce ironworks to rubble. Morning Herald, August 2nd, 1971. Before European immigrants and enslaved Africans lived and worked at Catoctin Furnace, the land was home to Susquehannocks, Five Nation Iroquois, Shawnee, Tuscarora, and Piscataway. Then, the iron industry dominated the village for 130 years until the growth of large corporations that produced iron more efficiently doomed the complex. In the early 20th century, company houses were purchased by families who had been employed in the furnace operation. In the 1970s, a planned expansion of U.S. Route 15 threatened the furnace and historic village. After a public outcry which ignited interest in preserving the site, the Maryland State Highway Administration altered their plans and shifted the planned roadway expansion to the west. In 1973, the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society Incorporated was formed and it continues its mission to preserve and restore this village. In Catoctin Furnace, the layers of history are deep and inclusive. Panel 9, read by Marquia Smith. Erasure and Rediscovery. The tragedy of slavery is writ large at Catoctin Furnace. We search for a descendant community to reconnect and rectify this lost legacy. The Contocton Furnace African American Cemetery is on a hill 360 feet to the south of this point. Marked by field stones, its graves hold the remains of men, women, and children of African ancestry. Many were enslaved workers, some of whom appear to have been brought directly from Africa for their valuable iron-working skills. Others may have been members of the Furnace area's free black population. The cemetery site is privately owned, and the Contocton Furnace Historical Society is dedicated to preserving and interpreting it. 
1979, archaeological investigations conducted during construction of the new highway uncovered the graves of 35 individuals thought to represent a third of the cemetery. A ground penetrating radar survey in 2014 identified 23 remaining burials. The Museum of the Iron Worker houses forensic facial reconstructions of two individuals a woman aged 30 to 35 years, and a young man aged 15 to 16 years. DNA tests and other forensic studies are revealing not only these early Marylanders' faces, but also signs of the harsh existence they endured. Panel 10, read by Ada McClure, Marquia Smith, and Jacob Boas. The Return of Names A person is not forgotten until his or her name is forgotten. Lucy. Elizabeth, Jack, James, Millie, Unknown, Phil, Nellie, Sam, John, Thomas, John, Hezekiah, Jenny, Rachel, Caddy, Clements, Maria, Petty, Sammy, Susanna, Ali, Hezekiah, Ann, Ben, Betty. Old Hannah, Betty, Kate, Bill, Jacob, Frederick, George, Bill, Unknown, Mary, Mary. Patty, Elsie, Esther, Unknown, Bill, Elias, Mary, Sue, Zachariah, Old Jack, Harriet, Harry. Harvey, Henry, Hetty, Hubert, Jack, Jacob, Unknown, Jane, Jane, Janie, Joe, Larkin. Len, Louis, Liddy, Clemens, Nathaniel, Julian, William of Elizabeth, Cecilia, Anais, Archibald, Unknown, Samuel. Christina, Nicholas, Yellow Girl, Hanson, Big Bill, Jane, Little Bill, Locke, Lorena, Luzinda, Magdalene, Maria, Mary. Romeo, Charity, George, Richard Jr., Unknown, Mary, Unknown, 
Maddie. Mill. Millie. Mingo. Nanny. Ned. Nell. Old Will. Paris. Chris. Rezzy. John. Charlotte. Big Dick. Christina. Isabella. Sam. Bob. Ann. Nace. Will. Mary. Daniel. Ann. Anthony. Richard. James. Unknown. Patsy. <clears throat> Unknown. Richard. Elizabeth. Georgiana. Samuel Hercules. Caroline. Unknown. Rachel. David. Eliza. Wally. Toby. Sue. Mary. Ben. James. Sam, John, Joseph, Ruth, Nathan, Anne, Sal, Rose, Harry, Bill, Henry, Isaac, Leonard, unknown, Leonard, Jeremiah, Nathaniel, Richard, William, Elizabeth, Hezekiah, Andrew, unknown, Priscilla, Phoebe, George, Jesse, Thomas, James, Richard, Thomas, Henry, Peter, Celeste, Benjamin, Unknown, Charles, Rebecca, Elise, Beside, John, Maria, William, George, Millie, William, Elise, Joseph, Anne, Elias, James, John, John, Mary, Mary, Otha, Anna, Unknown, Anne, Daniel, Meredith, Susan, Thomas, William, Unknown, Ellen, Lucky, Lucy, Peter, Sarah, Stacy, Wally, Sarah, James, John, Mary, Sarah, William,
John. Emily. James. Daniel. Polly. Unknown. Martin. Sylvester. Caroline. Henry. Jane. Joseph. Lucy. Martha. Philip. Sarah. Henry. John. Nathan. Arthur. Sarah. Susan. Isaac. Unknown. Julia. Henry. Peter. Julia. Nick. Peter. Sarah. Isaac. John. Simon. Andrew. Julia. Polly. Mary. Peter. Sarah. Sylvester. Eliza. George. Daniel. William. Jacob. Harrison. John. John. Joseph. Unknown. Mary. Moses. William. Farm Jacob. Total 271. Panel 11. Read by Elaine Bond Hyman. An unquiet place. An unquiet place, a path bisects it, and there are ore pits to the north and south. Even in death, there was no rest. Do you hear the constant hum of noise? This is traffic on U.S. Route 15, also known as the Catoctin Mountain Highway. The cemetery would not have been much quieter when the furnace was in operation because it was located next to an active ore pit and had a pathway running through it. Why do you think the cemetery was placed on a hill overlooking an ore pit and positioned to be visible to strangers and slave owners? What does the noisy and very public nature of this space tell us about the life and death of enslaved iron workers. How would the cemetery be different in daytime and at night? What might a funeral have been like? The following text is taken from Catoctin Cemetery, a poem published in Catoctin Slave Speak and written by this reader, Elaine Bond Hyman. Catoctin Cemetery. yourself. No talking up here. Whatever you doing, you got to quit it now. This here be our land bought with our life. They weren't shamed to do it. 
and we ain't shamed to tell it. Ever since we could stand, till we couldn't stand no more, we done migrated against our will, come over in ships, shackled, chained, starved, beaten. Some made it, sold and bought, bought and sold, ended up right here. This is where we lay. We was worked like mules, owned like dogs, fed like hogs, hunted like deer, skinned like buffalo, hung like bats, shot like wolves. You got to walk careful. You got to walk quiet. This where we be. Life and work within these walls. Panel read by Aidan McClure. The ruins before you are the remains of a mansion built circa 1785 and known for centuries as the Iron Master's Mansion or Catoctin Manor. The enormous house was surrounded by outbuildings, including quarters for the domestic and slaved and a carriage house. The wealth and prosperity this house represented in the late 18th and early 19th centuries were made possible by the labor and exploitation of enslaved African Americans. As you look at these ruins, imagine the work required to keep these houses running. Enslaved men, women, and children laid fires in each of the 10 fireplaces, cleaned the massive windows, and prepared lavish meals. Do you think the Iron Master and his family served daily by enslaved house servants? Understood that slavery made their lifestyle possible? Do you think those servants dreamed of their ancestry home in Africa and freedom? These residents of Catoctin Manor lived at the same time and occupied the same space, but their lives and worldviews were at odds. 